I've been catfishing jobs with my name for years, so <laughs> it's got connotations, right? Like, Brittany Alexis sounds like a woman who has a coffee mug that says coffee on the fried. <laughs> like, she knows her way around the TJ Maxx, let's be. <laughs> Brittany Alexis sounds like your bully from high school that's about to say, okay. <laughs> Someone always laughs at that part and always hurts my feelings. <laughs> But no, I sound like a bully from high school that's about to post a cryptic message, like uh, making moves in silence on Facebook. And then you later learn that those moves were just hey girly texts for her pyramid scheme. <laughs> so I get it. And then I'm doubling down on it because I look like I have a lot of gold cash. <laughs> that's a visual joke. Like take age to census, you know? Even my voice gets in on the action because I sound like someone whose favorite Jay-Z song has to be Brothers in Paris. <laughs> Brothers. Uh, emphasis on the hard art for that one. <laughs> so yeah, I'm telling you guys this so you know that I'm also aware that my overall vibe is like the edgy youth minister's vibe. Like, <laughs> I get it, I get it. And also, it kind of goes with my theme because we're going to talk about are diamonds actually forever? You might be surprised by the results. <laughs> but yeah, so the point of this presentation is to question our beliefs where they come from, and why we believe them. That's what the point of the presentation is. The point is not for me to tell you that you're wrong or to shame you. Um, and after, after we get into the presentation, you'll realize why that is, because I'm not going to be the reason why people <laughs> do or do not buy diamond engagement rings for their significant other. You cannot use this presentation <laughs> to tell your partner, see, Brittany, no, Brittany didn't say anything. <laughs> no, she didn't. She didn't. So, I do want to ask a couple questions, and by rounds of applause, please answer these questions. Have you ever been told that a diamond ring is necessary to propose? <laughs> Have you ever told that a diamond ring should at least, the diamond engagement ring specifically, should at least cost one month's salary or more? And uh, have you ever been told that a diamond ring's in, uh, size indicates the value of the relationship? Right. Do I have any people who are like particularly like very strong, like I want a diamond ring or I want to buy a diamond ring? <laughs> it's cool. I'm not. I'm not going to judge. I just want to ask a question. Does anyone have it? If not, I'll move on because you guys seem scared. Yeah, I'll move on. <laughs> so let's talk about it. Let's talk about the origins of diamond engagement rings. So diamond mining dates back to the 14th century, but up until the 1870s, when large deposits of diamonds were located. In Kimberley, South Africa, they were really just only aligned with this aristocracy. Like, only the really rich people were wearing these diamonds. Uh, by 1887, De Beers Consolidated Mines, which was then headed by a 27-year-old Cecil Rhodes, they bought all the, the mines in... <laughs> yeah, because we're going there. Uh, you know, they bought all the mines in Kimberley and began down the road of shaping the diamond industry as we know it today. So... Really, when did this you know, tradition of buying diamond ring engagement rings begin? So one thing led to another, which is a pretty easy way to just get from the 1870s down to like almost the 1930s. <laughs> and the diamond industry was seeking to rise in the 1930s landscape, and you might recognize the 1930s as a time where a couple of things were going on. Uh, namely, you know, the Great Depression, and the idea of rugged American individualism. So you have a lot of poor people who are not able to buy basic necessities, and we want to sell them diamond engagement rings. <laughs> how are we going to do that? And just to showcase that a little bit, I want to show you how hard it was for all of the companies. Like, all of the companies were struggling at this time. So this is a Scott's toilet paper ad. Um, and basically, this ad is telling you that there's this new disease called the toilet tissue disease. And if you buy cheap toilet paper, you're going to the hospital. And you're getting <laughs> rectal surgery. And you don't have to, it's actually called the infamous black glove ad. Um, and here's just an excerpt from it. The annual reports issued by public hospitals show an astonishing percentage of rectal cases, many of which require surgical treatment. 65% uh, of all men and women suffer from some form of rectal illness. <laughs> many of these cases are directly traceable to inferior toilet tissue. <laughs> <laughs> many, uh, it's like, Oh, chemical, yeah, toilet tissue, harsh, chemically impure toilet tissue made from reclaimed waste material. <laughs> As a safety precaution, millions of women are equipping their bathrooms with tissues that doctors and hospitals approve of for safety. Uh, and just to emphasize that, my girl's looking, she's looking stressed. She's looking worried about the toilet tissue disease. 
And again, toilet paper, I'm not gonna lie. I think that's kind of like a necessity. I don't know if 2020 told us anything, but I think more people share that, that belief. So if you're having a hard time selling toilet tissue, how are you gonna sell diamond engagement rings? Also, I don't know that Charmin has actually come out of the depression because you guys, a little bit more terrifying than this last toilet tissue at. Less than Charmin Charmin, I like to call them. But uh, yeah, let's go on. Myself. My name is NWRs. It's NWRs, that's the name. <laughs> so NWRs was an advertising agency that was founded in 1869. They called themselves the oldest advertising firm in the US. And in 1938, De Beers joined in lucrative matrimony with them via a one-year contract. I believe they gave up $10,000 for market research into the diamond market, and that 10K turned out to be very profitable very profitable for the company because between 1939 and 1979, their sales increased from $23 million annually to $2.1 billion annually. Right? Like, that's crazy. They really knew what they were doing. So, they did a lot, right? So, they conducted research and they found that some people believed that the larger the diamond ring, the more the love, and they capitalized on that, right? They were their original gatekeep gaslight girl boss. <laughs> I'm not even joking. You think ads are bad today? Wait until you hear what NW Ayers was doing, right? They engaged in psychological warfare to convince poor people that they needed diamond rings in order to even propose. And they ran, ran ads in magazines, but they didn't even stop there. And I'm not just joking about the psychological war warfare. They actually did use psychological warfare to sell diamond engagement rings. So, this is one of the first ads that they ran in August of 1939. It was a ladies home journal. And this is just an ex excerpt from that ad. This is their Christmas, uh, this Christmas um, ad. And basically it's saying, you know, just to go down a little bit. No human experience holds more delight than the culmination of a childhood's remembered bliss and the dawn of a Christmas betrothal morning, uh, Christmas morning. Right, so engaging on Christmas, that's great. You know, the diamond that marks this unusual day must be splendid indeed. For here's an anniversary that will never dim or be forgotten. They then go to say that the young man choosing such a Christmas gift as his engagement ring should make it expresses of the day and the future he anticipates. Uh, and to do so, he needs to be guided by a few simple precepts. So you have to go to a reliable mer merchant, look for the value and color, radiance, depth, and fine cutting, as well as a carat weight. And what's interesting about this is not only they're telling you you need to have a really nice engagement ring to propose, they're also telling you how to buy it and where to go to buy it. It's pretty good at it. But let's keep going. The next thing they did was the great art artist series. And basically they would align themselves with artists. I believe that this one is Salvador Dolly. And in this advertised, no, Pablo Picasso, oh my goodness. In this one, Pablo Picasso, they use this, this, this imagery of a child and their mother to show timeless love. Um, basically, the mother is caressing the child's arm as a comfort, and it you know, creates these memories of caring for the child. And these are things that, you know, these childhood memories, they're here today, but they're going to be with you forever. Um, so it's kind of showing the timelessness of diamond engagement rings and how important they are to express your love. There's even more. Uh, NW Wears uh, also had the beers get engaged with the war effort. Um, and this is where the idea of industrial grade diamonds versus gym quality diamonds come from. Because they still wanted to show you that you could be participating in the war effort. But it's not the diamond rings you're buying for your engagement rings. Those are totally different. And those are really, uh, those are good. Those are good to buy for your significant other. Um, and it was because FDR <laughs> wanted a lot of diamonds. So. It worked, it worked. Uh, but they also came for men. They came, and this is where some more of the psychological stuff takes place. So they ran ads for men affirming the masculinity of their consumers if they didn't skip, and showing that even the most elegant isn't above the implied dick joke. You know, it really was a situation of the bigger the rock, the bigger the bank account. Uh, <laughs> And it paid off. So they sold the idea that an engagement ring was an investment on your future. The goal was to create a situation where almost every person pledging marriage felt compelled to acquire a diamond engagement ring. And that's a direct quote from, from them. They were saying that. Uh, when asked if the diamond ring was a good investment, De Beers rep said, let me ask you, where else can a young man invest, say $200, and get a woman to cook for him, do his laundry, wow. sew his buttons, be a constant companion to him, and raise a family for him? 
Where else but in a diamond engagement or a wedding ring? <laughs> Oof, that's pretty, pretty rough. All right, there's even more. It doesn't stop there. Uh, Dorothy Dignam, she was a pub publicist for De Beers at NWR, and her first philosophy was that the big ones sell the small ones. So what she did, um, and other publicists did, they wrote newspaper columns and magazine stories about celebrity proposals, the diamond engagement rings, the type, the size, the worth of their diamonds. They also partnered with fashion designers um, to have them talk about the new diamond trend on radio shows. This was, again, single-handedly bought and paid for by De Beers and NWRs. So even more. Uh, the agency created a series of seminars on diamond engagement rings that targeted thousands of girls in high schools and colleges around the country. Jewelers would come in and give talks, such as the right ring for the left hand. Uh, <laughs> they were telling you every little detail that you needed to know. These were, you know, women's luncheons, uh, other gatherings. Gladys Babson Hanford, known in the industry as the Diamond Lady, she covered about 25,000 miles a year for the agency while lecturing about diamonds across the United States. They also supported fashion shows, gifted celebrities jewelry for events, galas, movies, and in 1947, they commissioned the series to showcase engaged socialites. Uh, their strategy was to socially influence the consumerism of diamond engagement rings from rings from the top down. Uh, they wanted a woman who, uh, one of that said that they wanted even the milkman's wife to be like, well, look at this one. She got her this diamond engagement ring. <laughs> Even though their salaries are much different, why can't you give me one? There's even more, because 1947 is when they coined the term that really struck gold. Uh, Francis Garrity coined the term diamonds are forever. That's when it happened, 1947. Uh, De Beers heard that the play Gentlemen Prefer Blondes was being adapted into a movie starring Marilyn Monroe. Uh, they had to capitalize on it, especially because they have that song in there, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friends. And it went from a satirical take on, you know, it was then referenced as a gold digging Lorelei to a very sultry song showing the elegance and timelessness of Marilyn Monroe and diamond engagement rings. De Beers was everywhere, everything, all at once, literally. They were killing the game. They were. And if you remember that song, in the song they tell you where you can go to buy these diamond engagement rings. So again, they're telling you you need this. It's glamorous, it's elegant, and you can go to these retailers to buy it. <laughs> so yeah, they were not only just telling you to buy diamond engagement rings, they were also telling you exactly how much to spend. So these are three different ads. How can you make two months salary last forever? <laughs> two months salary. If she really loved you, would you expect you to spend that much on her? I couldn't live without her, so I gave her a big incentive to stick around. <laughs> <laughs> Two months salary a small price to pay for something that lasts forever? Yeah, and then also you might notice they have beautiful women in these ads, so they're definitely talking to the men. <laughs> but they're, they're using every single you know, possibility and every path pathway to sell these diamonds. And here is a very small example of the marketing effect that this has had on our society. So some of these pages, this one is from a ring shaming group. How many of you have heard of ring shaming? Yeah, it's basically Facebook groups where they'll go in and be like, that time sucks. <laughs> and that's pretty much what this says. Uh, here's another one. Amy Schumer gets shamed for tiny engagement ring, right? This is a video where they're doing the street interviews and they're asking people, can I test your diamonds? And in this particular one, the guy said that the diamonds were like $2 million, which I'm like, sorry if you believe that, babe. Like, there's no way that diamond's $2 million. But it turned out not to be real. And she says, so I'm not worth the real ring. So again, you're associating your worth with diamond engagement rings and the value that somebody places on the relationship with how much they actually spend on a diamond engagement ring. Uh, and then I just included this Michael Spock reference, you know, <laughs> to your selling. So <laughs> every idea you have about diamond engagement rings, <laughs> again, was bought and paid for by De Beers. And I will say, the viewers definitely earned that money because they killed it. Uh, and again, I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't want a diamond engagement ring or that you can't, don't buy your significant other one. You can get lab-grown diamonds and stuff so you can avoid a lot of the ethical concerns, but I just don't want to be used in a fight with a couple. Like, that's really, <laughs> that's like my little disclaimer right here. <coughs> so, what do diamonds and the Confederacy have in common? <laughs> Total switcheroo on you, didn't know I was going there. I got you. 
All right, nothing lasts forever. That's what we have. That's what we have in common. Uh, I think that might be one of the few things we have. <laughs> so the Confederacy lasted four years, and I have made a non-existent list of all the things that I know that have lasted longer than the Confederacy. <laughs> That's number one. Rip rolling, that's been around longer than the Confederacy. The year 2020 somehow lasted much longer than the Confederacy. My crush on Nick Carter also lasted longer than the Confederacy, as well as my crush on Lil Romeo. That last, and this meme. This meme is older and lasted longer than the Confederacy. <laughs> so, how has the Confederacy endured? Winston Churchill is famous with quoting, uh, history is written by the victors. And I know you're asking, didn't the Confederacy lose? Yeah, they did. They did lose, they did lose. But white supremacy ideals did not. Uh, you've probably heard, it's not history, it's, it's, it's history, not hate. We can't take that down monuments because his, they're history. So I want to talk about that just really briefly. So these are the total states at the time of the Civil War. There were 32 states, right? This is how many were in the Confederacy. That's 11. The first number was 32. Like I said, I went to law school, I didn't go to math school. <laughs> that does not add up to having 31 states with Confederate monuments. Seems like a, it seems like a gross, it just seems the numbers. The numbers are just not making sense. They're not numbering for me. So, why? Why is that? Well, gaslighting is part of it. We'll get to that. <laughs> but why? It's because money talks. The majority of those monuments were built far after the Confederacy ended. They were built like 40 years afterwards you know, between 1890s and the 1950s. So not during the Civil War, which again lasted from 1861 to 1865. Uh, they might even be more of the OG girl, or what's it called, gatekeep, uh, gaslight girl bossers. Uh, they gate kept information. Um, one of those things is the, the same forces that took over public spaces to erect monuments to the Confederacy and its white supremacist tenants also kept a tight grip on the history taught to Southern pupils. So you might have heard of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They spent a lot of time and money going through and raising all these new ideas about the lost cause, reshaping textbooks, which included, again, a strong emphasis on that idea, use of the Civil War and Reconstruction, which again glorified white supremacist foundations of the Confederacy, uh, and they were used to justify segregation and authoritarian Jim Crow governance. As a matter of fact, I actually, they've done such a good job at reshaping that I got kicked out of the Confederacy Facebook group for quoting <laughs> the second, uh, the, you know, I, I quoted the vice president of the Confederacy that said, said that, yeah, Stevens, it said that um, the Confederacy was built on the cornerstone of the idea that, you know, black people were inferior to white people, and they got so mad at me, they lost me. <laughs> Not even being black was enough to do that, but quoting history, it was, which is insane, right? Gaslighting, where's that coming into play now? It's again, it's the history not hate argument. This is actually a statement from the president of the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy saying that they denounce white supremacy. Right. The Daughters of the, like, I'm just like, if your great great grandfathers heard that, they will be so mad right now. Uh. That's not what they were fighting for, man. And also, what about stuff in Confederate states? Because we're talking about monuments just generally, but it, it's not as simple as it seems either. So you see that this is the South Carolina State Legislature. There's a Confederate flag that was above it. Do you think that Confederate flag happens in the 1800s? Absolutely not. It was actually arrested in, or not arrested, it was erected in 1961. And many believe that it was, you know, in retaliation to the Civil Rights Movement. Um, yeah, the longest filibuster, John Thurmond, and it was in, again, against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and his son has now said that he's over the, the flag. He's over it, guys, so <laughs> we can just be done with it. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's just wanted you to challenge your ideas. That's it. That's all I have.